Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Michael. I'm Noah. And we are the Knights of Entertainment, a podcast covering your favorite and unknown anime, comic books, movies, games, and more weekly. We appreciate you being here and hope you enjoy the show. And this is what we are covering tonight. Unfortunately for everybody, uh, we have the third Robin Williams movie in three weeks. Uh, last one of the trilogy. <laughs> Now we have the angriest man in Brooklyn. We should do one where uh, a, a series where we we take an actor and watch every movie they've uh, thing they've been in <laughs> for like it'd be like it'd be like God dang welcome to the uh, the Robert uh, Robert De Niro saga. Oh God, imagine the Nicolas Cage ones. <laughs> welcome to the... <laughs> oh God, <laughs> as many as he's made. Dang. It'd be a good series though. Yeah, it'd be its own little creative playlist on YouTube. Nicolas Cage the uh, saga. Robert De Niro, Al Pacino. Uh, Johnny Sins, the porn star. <laughs> we watch everything he's been in. <laughs> well, I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> we'll watch, I'll watch them all. Okay. I'm a fan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you do good work, Johnny Sins. <laughs> all righty. So, uh, this movie is directed by Phil Alden Robinson, uh, written by Daniel Taplitz. It's based on a book, uh, The 92 Minutes of Mr. Bomb by Ossie Dagan. And uh, it stars Robin Williams, Mila Kunis, Peter Dinklage, James Earl Jones, and Melissa Leo. Mila Kunis. She's got a bit of a hot water lately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Her and Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, they should have shut up. I would have said nothing. Yeah. I'd throw him in jail. Uh, the film is narrated by Robin Williams. Oh. Uh, were oh, narrated. I thought for something like that, my head is said directed. <laughs> Uh, distributed by Lionsgate, released in May uh, May twenty third, twenty fourteen, uh, which is the same year that Robin Williams passed away. Mm-hmm. Uh, running time of eighty two minutes, uh, and it grossed six hundred and fifteen thousand. Or I guess it'd be million dollars. Yeah, you know, sixteen six hundred and fifteen million. Let me see. Yeah, because the way they write them, I'm assuming that's six hundred and fifteen million. That is six hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. I know it didn't just make that much money. Yeah, because I was like, $600 million? $600 million sounds more. $615,198.12. Well, it's not bad. Yeah, that's I'm assuming it's more than that. Cool. My guess is $615 million. They just didn't put the zeros at the end. I don't know. It doesn't seem like a lot, actually. We can check. Huh? Let me see. The movies don't. So yeah, six hundred and fifteen thousand is what it made it in box office. Yeah, they they broke the bank. <laughs> uh, Rotten Tomatoes. The critics gave it a nine percent. <laughs> that explains a lot. Yeah. Audience get audience gave it a thirty percent. Damn, no one liked it. Is it one of those movies where only I would like it? Like the movie Lock with Tom Hardy. Uh, <laughs> I found it funny because I fucking love that movie. Is that is this the movie where uh uh, uh what's his name uh C K Lewis? Is that how you say his name? See, uh, Louis? Louis C.K.? Louis C.K., where he, he bangs Mila Kunis? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want him to see him bang anybody. <laughs> Nothing against you, Louis, but, you know. <laughs> right. Come on. This is what some of the critics had to say about it, because these are just... <laughs> uh, with a runtime of about 80 minutes, this treatment still feels padded with moments that feel utterly useless because they're not fully developed or simply used as a matter of convenience. And that was by Nicholas Bell. But he reviewed it, a one out of five, on August 30th of 2019. Why would you wait that long to review it? Because he, he, he as, a, as a critic. He had a backlog. <laughs> the last one. It's like, Jesus Christ, though. We have uh, Morgan Rojas from Cine, uh, Cinema, uh, Cinema C. The angriest man in Brooklyn is surprising, but for all the wrong reasons. And this is from 2018. Uh, we have uh, Tony Macklin. The angriest man in Brooklyn is like a brilliant a brilliant clown stumbling off stage accompanied by a kazoo. <laughs> Scott Nash says, The message of the movie is not uh, to waste the time you're given. That includes watching movies as bad as this one. You should always watch a bad movie. If you're trying to be like a screenwriter, you should watch like, a lot of movies. Yeah. You'll see the good and the bad. I mean, have you seen Fantastic Four, that remake? Yes. <laughs> I'll never understand <laughs> who got paid. Who, whoever wrote it, right? Must have been a, it. Must have been a banger, right? Because because they greenlit it. Yeah. And then whoever rewrote it must have lost their fucking minds. <laughs> uh, Dustin Putman, uh, tonality and creatively messy. 
and filled with an entirely too much shouting. In the case of the angriest man in Brooklyn, less would have been much, much more. Jeff Beck, The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, is a film that's never sure which way it wants to lean, leading to a very confused tone for the movie that has nothing original to offer in this uh, cliche-filled cliche -filled storyline. I don't know where I got glitch. <laughs> cliche. Because we didn't have the, uh, the little the E. The cliche. The little E with the little yeah, yeah. dash. Yeah, he didn't have that. Or I guess he got apostrophe on top of it. He just put cliche. See, he's a critic and he can't even fucking type. <laughs> so, guess that autocorrect does people dirty. <laughs> I'm always saying fuck, not duck. <laughs> if anybody has a question about it, it's fuck, not duck. Uh, Leonard Moulton wrote, The angriest man in Brooklyn doesn't seem to know what chord to strike. It veers wildly from madcap farce to social satire to sentimental family drama. Peter Dubridge says... A uh, schmaltz opera that indulges Robin Williams' most uh, melancholy ticks and themes. And it goes on and on and on. Is and that me or has this train gone by like four times since we started recording? Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's fun to live close to, tra to train tracks. <laughs> All righty. We have uh, Robin Williams as Hen uh, Henry Altman. We have Mina, uh, Mila Kunis as Dr. Sharon Gill. We have Peter Dinklage as Aaron Altman. My boy Peter Dinklage in there? Mm -hmm. that, that should be a porn star name. I don't know what he's waiting through his life. What a mainstream. <laughs> she may go into porn. <laughs> Melissa Leo is Bette Altman. Hamish Linklater is Tony Altman. James Earl Jones is Reuben. Sutton Foster is Adela. Uh, Richard Kind is Bixfield. Uh, let's see. Louis C.K. is Dr. Felding. Wait, so is he in this movie, or yeah. does he just narrate it? Robin Williams? Yeah. He's in it. Okay. He's definitely in it. And Olga Marides as Jane. Well, so, we start off uh, stuck in Brooklyn traffic while on his way to a doctor's appointment. Uh, Henry Altman, which is Robin Williams, uh, a car is suddenly struck by a taxi. Propelling him into rage, he unleashes upon the taxi driver. Since he just got hit. Which is what? He says unleashes. Into, uh, into what the? Oh, uh, into a tyrant? Yeah. Pretty he, that, like, he unleashes. I'm like, did he like pull his dick out and start, did he burst on him? Like, he fucking started hitting him? At least what? <laughs> That's how the movie starts. He's already in a pissy mood. Arriving at the Brooklyn Hospital, Dr. Sharon Gill, who is covering for Henry's normal doctor, uh, Louis C.K., whom she is having an affair with, of all the people to have an affair with, you picked Louis C.K. That are nothing, right. nothing against you, Louis C.K. But come on. But he's uh, as soon as he goes in there, uh, Henry Altman's like, "Oh, son of a bitch! Not my normal dog." Yeah, I'd probably feel the same way. Who the fuck is you? <laughs> Examining scans of his brain, she informs him that he has a brain aneurysm with a poor prognosis, and he's like, "The fuck is it? Just tell me what the fuck is it?" <laughs> The angry Robin Williams. Yes. He erupts, throwing insults at her and demanding that she tell him how long he has to live. She tries to dodge the question, but Henry is persistent. Panicking and overwhelmed because she's kind of on uh, pills, too. Oh, man. Come on, me. Like pain pills? Yeah. To me, you're better than this. Or like psycho, like where is she? Antipsychotics? Not antipsychotics, like uh, pills like uh, probably Xanax. Anxiety pills? Yeah. So she panics, and she's uh, Sharon sees a cover of a magazine that says 90 minutes and blurts that out to him. <laughs> and he leaves irate after that. Talking with another doctor, Sharon realizes the consequences of her actions. She will surely be fired and lose her license for telling him this. She resolves to find Henry and put him into an immediate care center. Because she he walked out like, the fuck? 90 minutes. Jesus. Son of a bitch. Did this turn, turn, did this turn into the movie Crank? <laughs> Have you ever seen Crank? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, boy. That's a, that's a roller coaster for you. <laughs> Henry arrives at uh, his family law firm, storming into a meeting between his brother Aaron and clients. Aaron's uh, Peter Dinklage's character. My boy. They're my man. He asks what a hypothetical client with only 90 minutes to live should do. One says, make love to his wife one last time. 
Henry then rushes home to his estranged wife, Bet, only to catch her having an affair with her neighbor. Damn. Three, like, three some it is before I die. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sharon learns Henry's case is serious enough that he could potentially die at any minute. That's only issue. She, she, she was not one. Yeah, she just didn't know that. Oh, the boy. Yeah. That's why he didn't have, that's why he didn't, oh, he doesn't have time to turn into Walter White. No. Jesse, you want to cock it? <laughs> I'm watching Breaking Bad right now. Hey, Jesse, let's cock it. <laughs> Sharon arrives at Henry's office, where she tells Aaron of his brother's diagnosis. Wait, wait let me, cause I'm, I was watching Breaking Bad, right? And uh, I, spoilers, guys, if you haven't watched it, but you need to get on that. There's a scene where his wife uh, wants to divorce because she finds out that he's making meth. Yeah. And uh, he, so he moves out to a different apartment, and she calls him on the phone because he was trying to uh, harass her and mm-hmm. try to get his son back, right? And she she tells him on the phone, uh, he's laying on the floor because he just had a bender. Yeah. Like, he had a bender. <laughs> he's in his underwear. You know, it's fucking, you know, it's Hank. Or it's not Hank, it's Hal from... Uh, Malcolm Mal- Mal- in the middle. Yeah. So he's just in his underwear, and she says, "Like, if you don't leave us alone, I'm gonna get a restraining restraining order." And he he climbs to the phone. He grabs the phone. The, the phone doesn't uh, it did disconnect Lori because they can talk to her. Yeah. Because she left her on his voicemail, and he just flips. And he's like, "Right, restrain, restrain this, restrain this," and he starts fucking rubbing his dick. Restrain this. And I'm like, "What the fuck is going on?" And I I I went back like. Netflix can look at my algorithm. I went back 15 times yeah. to the point of restraint. That's when he was grabbing his dick. Restraint. That's <laughs> He's so fucking mad. I had to never get over uh, fucking Hal from Malcolm and grabbing his dick. <laughs> he did it once before when he uh, when he quit his uh, car wash job. Yeah. He said, wipe down this. Yeah. He fucking grabbed his dick. Wipe down this. <laughs> well, back to the movie. <laughs> restraint. <this. laughs> So she arrives to Henry's office, where she tells Peter Dinklage, his character Aaron. <clears throat> oh, I... wait. So let me get. Uh, he's their brothers, or they're brothers? brothers. Peter Dinklage and Rob Williams in this movie are brothers. Cool. <laughs> he tells her that Henry was a, uh, once a kind, happy man, but became embittered after the death of his son Peter two years prior. Wow. Meanwhile, Henry makes more stops on his quest for redemption, including attempting to contact his uh, surviving son Tommy. He has uh, he uh, had disapproved of his son's choice to become a professional dancer, creating a rift, and not uh, not a, not a stripper, not a professional dancer like that. That would have been funny. That would have been awesome if he he goes to the strip club right and his son is just fucking just clapping cheeks and like <laughs> on the dance floor, <laughs> fucking his cheeks are just fucking bouncing. <laughs> so I need to talk to you, son. Can you get down from the pole? He makes a recording telling Tommy that he loves him. But flies into a rage halfway through and passes out. Wait, what is he? Why is he having such a temper? Yeah, because I uh, he basically he got uh, to make a recording of himself because he's wanted to film himself one last time because he thinks he's gonna die. Yeah. So he goes into a pawn shop that uh, James Earl Jones is the <laughs> store person there. Interesting. But James Earl Jones plays a character that has a bad stuttering problem. So he goes in there and he's like. I I just need a I need a camera I need a camera something right he goes and they're wanting the camera do you want this one oh or it wasn't a lost issue he was getting more and more and more pissed the entire time and then fuck you then when he left Jesus so he recorded himself and he asked the homeless person if he could film it why just put it on the fucking table I don't I don't know what the fuck's going on it's funny. So you got the homeless guy trying to film him to show that, uh, that uh, like, he's trying to make a video for his son. Yeah. Saying that uh, he loved him and stuff like that, but then he says he gets more and more pissed about all the things that he hasn't said. So he starts going into kind of a rage and then just passes out from that. And what, the homeless guy walks out with the camera? Yeah. Well, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when Henry regains consciousness, he goes to the Brooklyn Bridge, intending to jump off. Sharon begs, uh, Sharon finds him there, apologizes for her earlier behavior, admitting that she has no idea when he might die. How did she find him? She uh, kept going around trying to figure out where the fuck he was. That uh, is she, the she, worst plot line yes. I've ever heard of. She, uh, she found the homeless person that had the camera, and she paid him for it, so she got the camera back. How, wait, how did she know about the camera? Because she, uh, she like, following where he had been. So she somehow makes, the, the, what is she, a detective? 
kind of uh, she played almost a detective character yeah <laughs> so she finds him eventually and uh she begs him not to jump saying that her career and by extension her life will be over if he does and at this point he doesn't give a fuck i imagine like, I... why would you do that to someone why henry still leaps off the bridge oh wow however and uh sharon rushes into the river dragging him to shore because he floats down the river he didn't uh how high is the brooklyn bridge so you'd crack all your shit hitting the ground or hitting the water it's decently high but yeah this movie is highly illogical he realizes it's a second chance for life after he <laughs> she gets to the shore and he's still alive and asks her to help him uh, make things right with his family check in her watch uh he sees uh he only has 19 minutes left after she told, because this is all happening within her telling him he's got ninety minutes to live. Did she just tell him that she made a mistake or something? Yeah. So what? what how does he still assume it's ninety minutes? I guess he doesn't believe her. <laughs> God dang, this movie's horrible. Oh. Sure, Sharon hails a cab, driven by the same uh, cabbie who hit Henry that morning. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the men begin to fight, but she momentarily blinds the driver with pepper spray, and they take off in his cab. So they steal his cab. She's not exactly, I mean. She, she's not a great person, no. Not that. I mean, she, if she's trying to keep her job, she ain't doing a good job to begin with by stealing a fucking cab. Well, she could always say, well, I had to get him to the uh, hospital. By pepper spraying the duck. Mm-hmm. Driving to the Brooklyn Dancing Academy, Henry finds Tom, uh, Tommy sitting alone. They begin to dance, just like whenever Tommy was a little boy. After sharing a moment with his son, Henry informs Sharon that uh, he does not want to know when he will die. He only wants to know that he will try, uh, that he will try and lead a better life, and that they can both find happiness. After he makes fun of her, basically, he's like, "You need to get off the pills," <laughs> because she tells him how it's like, "My life is gonna be over," and it's like, "I've been taking pills," I've been... because <laughs> she starts going off too, because she doesn't can't take it no more. I've been taking a doggy by Louis C.K. Yeah, I saw that scene somewhere, <laughs> without the context of the whole movie. He then collapses on her shoulder, exhausted. Henry goes to the hospital and lives for another eight days, oh. giving him time to share special moments with his family in that time. Jesus Christ. So he does end up dying. Eight days? Yeah. Not 90 minutes, but eight days. One year later, after Henry's death, Bet, Tommy, Aaron, and Sharon are all together on a ferry celebrating his life and spreading his ashes into the East River. The captain of the cruise ship tells them it's illegal, but they berate him in uh, Henry's honor. And started saying, who the fuck are you to tell? <laughs> the same way that he would have. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how the movie ends. Hmm. Got to watch it. It's it's not a 10 out of 10. It doesn't sound like it's a... <laughs> but I, I think that a lot of the people that uh, watched it were expecting something else from Robin Williams. So they were expecting an extremely high level of comedy in it. And it's more of like a, maybe a five and a half, six out of ten, but not a thirty. A thirty, I think, is a little bit too low. But that is, that uh, concludes the uh, the trilogy of Robin Williams movies. Robin Williams. And what's really weird is like uh, in those last couple of years, he made a couple of movies where he's committing suicide and shit. It's like that was, oh. that was a bit of a. It's like fuck. <laughs> He jumped off a bridge. His son died in the other movie. Yeah, well, his son died in the weirdest way he could have possibly died by fucking jacking off to a, with a fucking uh, belt around his neck. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Robin Williams, he started making some really dark movies in those last couple of years. Probably had a lot of his mind. I would think so. But anything else to add before we head out for the day? How how rough is the the scene with Mila Kunis and Louis C.K.? Were you were you just like ah oh, I caught out of nowhere? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh God! You're like oh no! It's like oh no! You know what caught me one time like that? An unexpected scene was a movie called uh uh fuck I forgot what it's called. Uh, it stars um Craig Robertson mm-hmm. and uh, uh Aubrey Plaza or is it Audrey Plaza? I think it's Audrey. Uh, I, forgot what it, I forgot what it's called. And don't quote me with the title, but <laughs> basically, the, the, the this woman leaves her husband because she uh, sees uh, that there's an article 
in a newspaper or something or in a commercial that one of her ex-lovers or boyfriends or someone that she knew was back in town and having a seminar mm -hmm. at the hotel. So she leaves, the husband gets upset, and he follows after her with one of his friends. But one of them, and they're looking for her, and so one of, his, one of his friends decides to go to the bar to get a drink. This uh, uh, bigger woman, the, the guy's big as it is, you know, he's a large man, and the woman's also large. So they're, all, they're both BBWs. They're big, beautiful, uh, well, BBP? Big, beautiful people. And... Uh, uh, he takes a big, the, the whole swig of beer, and then he does a burp, and she giggles, right? Because I guess she found his burp attractive, and then, like a, like that, like that's, and then they're just fucking doggy. Both of them are ass naked. There's just so much meat on screen, and he's screaming, "Who gave me that beer?" And she's screaming, "I, I gave you that beer. Who gave me that beer? I gave you that beer." And I'm just like, "Whoa, this was, this was giggling." I mean, like, I don't know. No, I was like, "Let me rewind real quick." So it it caught me, me so out of like I was because sometimes you just like watch the movie and it just catches you. There's a scene that'll catch you, and you're just like it will like it'll like you might be watching it like the background, right? Yeah, and then it'll just like hit you like whoa, wait, oh, what's going on? <laughs> See, for me with the Louis C.K. thing, it's skip, skip fifteen seconds, skip fifteen seconds. Nobody wants to. See you got to watch it all. No, not with not with me, Lacunas. No, ah. <laughs> not Louis C.K. Oh God, no. Nobody wants to see that shit. I'll see everything once. <laughs> you can only live once. Might as well enjoy the life. All right. And with that, we will see you guys on the next one. <laughs> <laughs>